Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, as we have uh, the room filling up, uh, very excited to be here today. I think for those of us who've been joining uh, the, the various sessions that have been taking place today since the summit has kicked off, uh, we'll have to agree that it's been very insightful, a lot that we have taken in and really glad uh, to be here with you today. My name is Paddy Sianga Knudsen. I'm a migration governance uh, expert and the Vice President of the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism. And I will be your moderator for today. Really delighted uh, to be here in this space, welcoming everyone uh, joining us from various spaces and from around the world. You are welcome. Uh, we are here for quite um, an interesting ride. We're hoping that it will be very participatory in nature. And so please, as you settle down, we hope that you have your glass of water, cup of coffee, uh, uh, just something to keep quenching your thirst as we will be engaging in, uh, in, in a discussion uh, for most of the time that we have here today in this technical working group um, uh, that is focusing on diaspora cultural capital. Uh, we've had a lot of de deliberations and other sessions that have indeed, um, I think, fed into a lot of the discussion Discussions here today. Uh, so you are welcome and thank you for joining us. Just a quick run uh, of what, uh, you know, a bit of house rules. We know everyone is very familiar with the use of uh, uh, Zoom and virtual platforms, but good to remind ourselves that it's best that we have our microphones muted uh, while we are in the room just to allow us to be able to hear uh, the speakers. You will be um, given an opportunity to be unmuted uh, when you're sharing a bit later. Very nice always to see friendly faces on screen. So feel free to have your screen on uh, and it will be nice to be joined on screen so you are welcome. Uh, a reminder that we do also have interpretation that is available and I think we've had some of uh, the colleagues showing the, the screen there on the language interpretation. There are a couple of buttons down there that can be clicked so that you are able to join us and be comfortable in the language that you're most comfortable in uh, to, to, to communicate in. Um, and, and just also to as a reminder as we use the chat and as we share questions that we really are using using courteous language uh, and we're adhering to some time limitations so that we make sure that you know everyone is afforded a chance uh, for us uh, to speak today. As we said, it's participatory in nature. It's a technical working group. Uh, so we hope that you know, you, you've come uh, engaged, not just to listen, but also engage in a way that we're here to learn from the different spaces that you're joining us from uh, sharing with us um, you know, from the different presentations that will be made. So maybe just a quick run um, of, of what we will be doing doing today. Uh, I will be repeating this a bit later, so we will not uh, dive uh, a bit into it before I would introduce our host uh, here today. So we will have a word from our host. Um, and after that, uh, we will go ahead and listen to the background paper that has been prepared um, and, and in which we will then go to the regional consultative um, uh, reflections, if one may call that, that are coming from three regions. And we're glad to have um, representatives from the, free re uh, from the regions. And then we will dive into the meat uh, of the discussion and engage in hopefully a very um, engaging discussion and interactive session with everyone that is here um, today. Uh, I must just pay homage uh, once again, thanking uh, the host government that is keeping us uh, here today. Uh, just uh, to say thank you very much to uh, Her Excellency Fulvia Elvira Benavides uh, Cortes, uh, and also accompanied by Mr. Carlos Cor uh, Cordoba, uh, who are representing the government of Colombia. And we will be hearing a bit more and sharing um, also a bit more when we get to the session where they they, they will come um, and share a bit with us. Um, and just, you know, as we are just, you know, uh, running through this, I think what is, what is essentially important is for us to zero in uh, a little bit and have an understanding of, uh, of why we're here for this technical working group. We've had sessions this morning and one would be asking, why have we split the four technical working groups? So just as a background explainer to the reason and why we're here. Uh, we try to coin diaspora capital uh, into some definitions that have been defined around the Networking Institute. We'll be sharing a couple of those if people want to know them. But where we're really seeing uh, diaspora capital as an overseas resource available to a country, a region, a city, an organization, and location. And indeed, it's made up of flows of people, of networks, finance, ideas, attitudes, and concerns for places of origin, ancestry, and affinity. Uh, so in short, flows of people, knowledge, and money. 
And at the same time, we really are um, realizing that the mobilization of capital um, uh, through what IOM calls its three E strategies to engage, enable, and to empower diaspora communities. And so these technical working groups are have actually been did a, a great way uh, for us to engage diaspora on sort of four different types of diaspora capital and uh, through IOM's experience in the field and many others uh, that engage with IOM uh, for that matter, this technical working group wanted to just focus on that cultural capital aspect. So one may be asking, what do we mean by cultural capital? And here we're looking at this acquisition and transfer of new values and perspective and ideas that enrich the diversity and resilience of societies. And indeed realizing that diaspora have agency and they have um, a lot that they could bring to the table. So what we would what would we like to sort of get um, as we are coming out of this technical working group, um, being kind of conscious of time? We sort of want to look around three key questions. And these three key key questions uh, want to look at, you know, the place of building long-term and sustainable mechanisms to engage diaspora Cap, uh, cultural capital. And therefore, uh, we are looking at three particular aspects. What are those key institutional mechanisms? What are those key informational mechanisms? And what are those key implementation mechanisms? Now, when we look at these three, um, if you'd like, pillars or, 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 or areas, you know, how do then, you know, how do then governments in countries of origin and resilience, what do they need uh, in place to order, uh, in order to, to build these long-term and sustainable mechanisms so that they engage with diaspora cultural capital. So these are sort of the, you know, institutional, informational and implementation mechanisms. And we're really hoping that we'll be able to, um, to dive um, in a lot of this. There's a lot of expertise that's around uh, the table and there's, you know, just the experience of having a virtual network, a virtual space. So we're really hoping that, you know, bring out your authentic ideas, uh, bring out what's different from your spaces. It's a space for us to learn. Uh, and I like that in the space of culture, I think it's also very important for us to be paying a lot of homage to uh, to the different spaces that we represent. So we are here for all the diversity um, and the diverse views that are coming out and, and, and for all the contributions that diaspora organizations, individuals, and those who are joining us in the room will be able to share. So um, essentially, we have also shared, I think a, a guide has gone out, a, a background document, and we'll be hearing a bit more about that. So you don't have to rush and open the link to the guide because we have... Um, we have colleagues from the International Organization for Migration uh, who will be sharing and diving into that background uh, document. So we'll have an opportunity to listen and engage with it. Uh, but I think as uh, it's very important, I think, when we talk about, you know, these, these aspects that we have dug into, whether we're looking at the institutional aspect, the implementation aspect, from the institutional point of view, I think it's important to know that we have the policies, the strategies, uh, and we have, uh, you know, whether we're talking about diaspora ministries, desks, um, uh, and and whichever ministry they may be placed in, when we're, we're talking about that whole of government approach. So that perspective remains uh, particularly important, as well as looking at other strategies that look at research and development that touch on data, uh, very interesting uh, deliberations that also touched on that this morning, uh, but also looking at communication being very important. From that implementation aspect, I think it's good to remind ourselves that a lot is happening on the ground. There are various uh, programs uh, that are out there. There's a lot of talk around resources, and so the allocation of resources remains essentially important. And so please feel free to just come out and share with us those experiences that are on the ground uh, in order for us uh, within this space to build up uh, on what is already existing on the various platforms and on the paper. Uh, and, you know, just looking forward uh, one may ask, why are we sitting here? And, you know, why are we asking some of these questions? Why are these questions important? Well, you know, the, the so-called future agenda document of the GDS has been designed in order for us to take on reflections and the reflections that come from um, various parties on these particular issues are critically important because at the end of the day, when you have a statement that has that uh, global collaborative action, it's important that it has a global, it has had a global um it has had, it's been tested at a global platform such as this one where we're here. And these are essentially important for when we talk about the future of diaspora engagement. So that's very important for us, you know, in, in really coming, uh, coming back to everyone and, and, and being able to bring out all these discussions through this uh, technical uh, session that we have here today. So, uh, 
a lot uh, I have said, and maybe the interpreters may even be sending me a message in the private box and saying, slow down a little bit. Uh, but, you know, uh, the idea indeed um, is for us uh, to be able to hear, uh, for, for us to be able to hear not only just from our speakers, but very important, again, repeating on this collective core design of the future vision for diaspora engagement, particularly when we look at cultural capital. And uh, with these words, I would like to hand over to our government uh, session host. Uh, and again, just to introduce um, uh, Her Excellency uh, uh, to come and join us and give us some words. And even just as I see um, maybe her unmuting uh, uh, herself and uh, coming on just to share a bit of her bio, um, uh, Her Excellency uh, Fulvia Elvira Benavides uh, Cortes is the Director of Immigration and Consular Affairs and Citizen uh, Service at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And she has been holding this position for a third time now. She's a lawyer by background, a specialist in high state uh, management. She's engaged with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for nearly 40 years. And she has held various important positions, including a General Secretary, working as a Director of International Cooperation, but as well as being the Consul General of Colombia in Santiago de Chile. Uh, she has served as Ambassador to the government of um, to the government of the plurinational state of Bolivia. She's been charge d'affaires of the Embassy of Colombia in Finland and the Ambassador of Colombia in El Salvador. So, Ambassador, we're really glad uh, to be here in your home uh, as you welcome us and uh, passing over the word to you. Ambassador, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabia, for this introduction of for me as this meeting. But now I'm going to change to the Spanish because I prefer to work in this language. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, ante todo, Thank you so much. Firstly, I would like to un underline the, the IOM leadership when in the compact for um, secure, regular, and ordained migration at the UN in 2018, where 23 goals were established as a roadmap that include the measures for its application, follow-up, and examination. In 2019, there was a summit, a diaspora summit, and it was a call for the countries of the global compact to create the necessary conditions so that migrants and diaspora can contribute in fully to um, um, sustainable development in every country. In that framework, Colombia has been invited to, to participate in a technical working group on uh, the cultural capital of diaspora. Um, Colombia was a immigrant country, and so our policies is orientated as established in the decree uh, 21 26 of uh, in 92 uh, to uh, uh, create links with the Colombian. Uh, uh, groups abroad uh, in order to promote Colombia's image uh, abroad and promote cultural links. In uh, 2004, we strengthened this work of uh, the Colombian state with the diaspora, and we coordinated the group um, Colombiano Sune. Uh, we provided uh, citizen services in order to strengthen links uh, among uh, Colombians abroad and their families in the country and the um, regions and in order to uh, study the Colombian diaspora to establish their needs and to define uh, public policies in order to satisfy their needs. From this uh, legal framework, um, Colombia is strengthening the, the cultural links with uh, the diaspora, including uh, those of second and third generation. During this process, we found uh, collective building opportunities that will strengthen the belonging sense and identity. And this becomes an asset for, an asset for everyone. When the diaspora reivindicates the cultural values, they make us visible in their host country. And so we 
are at their disposal in order to be acknowledged, to be known and disseminated. And so Colombia thanks every Colombian abroad, especially uh, writers, sculptors, uh, artists, uh, painters, musicians, and teachers who show the world what we are and how we dream of ourselves. On our behalf, our uh, commitment with the diaspora of uh, second and third generation is to keep on building spaces and projects in, so to um, promote uh, the knowledge of our uh, ancestral civilization and to disseminate in every scenario. The um, Foreign Affairs Ministry, uh, along with uh, Colombian uh, consulates, promote uh, projects that will uh, eradicate the lack of fruits and those uh, cultural um, projects are designed uh, depending on the characteristics of the Colombian uh, community abroad. For some projects, some consulates where we have uh, quite a number of Colombians, they have a um, multiplication of the Colombian Uni, which also be, be belong to the Colombian community. In the task force, uh, where we bring in the Colombian associations, uh, community leaders and members of the general community. So the Colombian multiplicator um, unites us uh, uh, under the guides of the ministry and uh, identifies the risk of um, uh, losing the roots and after this work we provide some actions such as uh, teaching Spanish to Colombian uh, children in Europa and in Lebanon, Syria and others uh, through digital channels in of Colombia no su name. Some sessions are live. We have uh, some uh, awards on uh, writing, painting, and art on the um, um, on, on the beauty of Colombia, and this art is uh, late, then um, promoted. We create activities for uh, the uh, Colombian children, for example. Um, music and and covers and they specialize in the interpretation of Colombian mus music. During the pandemic, in order to answer the needs of the Colombian communities, I'm talking about economical, emotional, family needs, through consulate, we uh, created cultural initiatives that have to mitigate the crisis in hundreds of families have we created um, a card, a digital card with recipes by uh, Colombians uh, who live in Ontario, Canada. We create digital directories of uh, entrepreneurs in order to get uh, to know each other and to finance the art. We had a virtual um, workshop uh, for music for children and adults in Chile. We created an initiative for uh, Colombian artists in the uh, um, Colombian consulate in Barcelona, and they could show the work for some weeks. And also, we had some activities in the digital communities. We organized ourselves with several consulates, and we uh, held several um, workshops uh, with artists um, and it was a showcase of resilience and entrepreneurship. We strengthened the sense of belonging during the pandemic and during the new normality. And so the consulates are created, creating um, commemoration um, 
um, days in order to provide visibility to uh, Colombian communities and individuals who work for our culture, uh, singers, artists, writers. They are all disseminating the roots of the cultural diaspora. On the other hand, the service for the citizen in consulates work uh, according to our internationalization mission who seeks to uh, raise the um, competitivity of the country and they underlined the diaspora of our country and the fact of being a migrant, they should um, uh, allow them um, to uh, uh, be considered as Colombian. So we have uh, some uh, strategy for the sense of belonging, not only abroad, but also in our own country in order to strengthen them in this global uh, world and to bring them to life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for sharing uh, those reflections and uh, really uh, sharing with us uh, the experience of Colombia in engaging with its diaspora and in raising um, and highlighting uh, the cultural capital that is available there. Uh, it's very interesting to, to hear I think also the the interactions with the different spaces, whether it's you know technology and also kind of the, the intentional space that's there to make um, uh, uh, linkages to a sense of belonging. Um, and if if possible, it would be great for us to also hear from um, Mr. Carlos. Mr. Carlos, are you there? Thank you so much, buddy. Okay, yeah. just making sure you're there and then and just- Thank uh, you so much short. to our ambassador, Fulvia Benavides. It was a clear explanation of the things that our government is doing in favor of our diaspora. So I want to, I want to share with you uh, maybe ideas, uh, about topics and examples about the topics uh, about um, our ambassadors will be talk about. Could you please tell me if it is my, thank you so much. Well, at the beginning, I'll switch to Spanish. Um, We, um, nosotros, uh, como lo mencionaba la embajadora Fulvia. As the ambassador, Ms. Fulvia was mentioning before, we as a state have discovered the opportunities within diaspora and migration, which is connected to a specific commemoration. And we think that's the key for this development of opportunities. There is a social element in this commemoration. It is the day of the migrant, the Colombian migrant. Let me just check the main guidelines on which this conversation is based. The ambassador rightly and precisely explained the role of Colombia when it comes to foreign affairs and foreign relationships. And this is what she so rightly underscored. And as I mentioned before, we need to underline again that Colombia is committed with migration and diaspora and that 
is crystal clear, especially through the public policies action. As the ambassador explained to us, there is an action in order to internationalize this diaspora in the different scenarios, in the different nations, fostering the development. And this is done intersectionally and interculturally within the social environment. Some of the public policies of the Colombian state include since for the last two years, but I said, the celebration of this day. It is celebrated in October and it allows to every migrant to celebrate with different activities that gather Colombians living abroad. And there's a myriad of practices entrepreneurship, educational activities, trainings and formative activities, everything cross-cutting. So this has been our labor in order to foster culture as a meeting point in the international arena. All these activities worldwide have this element in common, the culture embedded in them. This culture enshrined in that Colombian person who migrates and at the end, this Colombian culture plus the culture of the destination country creates an amalgam and a mixture, a very special one. And these Colombians, and going as far as the second and third generations, understand the ancestral role models in their very own origin countries, home countries. And this is what we've been working on in order to extol Colombian culture and everything embedded in it. The ambassador also referred to the fact that these are initiatives from the civil society and supported by the state. And they are connected to the daily activity of every Colombian. Not only abroad, but in general. What happened with the COVID-19 situation? It locked down society. But even though with this situation, the cultural practices could not be stopped. And the consulate with Colombia Unite Us could put into place these actions in order to continue fostering the cultural bonds. The Minister Benavides always cared for cohesion, pertinence within these activities. That's why today we can say, we can proudly say that we're going back to normal, not only in Colombia, but in the destination countries of the migrants. And these channels are very important, these vehicles, in order to promote these different areas 
of work and culture within a daily life in our diaspora. What we see today is that the pandemic offered us an opportunity. And this opportunity makes us strive into the future and work with the second and third generation. This virtual platforms in order to interact. All the institutions in Colombia are supporting the activity of the consulates. What do we see in the near future? We're going to gather data in order to build up a public policy that actually gives an answer to the needs of the diaspora and defines clearly the context in which the diaspora, the diaspora is set. Because the destination countries have a different set of things to offer. We want pertinent and appropriate services for these communities in each and every country where they are. We want to use these information tools for this purpose and keep the accounts on the cultural capital that diaspora represents. The Colombian state has always been deeply concerned and interested in migration and the Colombian state is very clear with this and is fostering reciprocity when it comes to every issue related to migration. And I'm very thankful to have been capable of um, sharing this experience of Colombia and Osune Colombia Unites Us from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that um, uh, embeds all the diplomacy all over the world. Thank you very much. Mr. Carlos Cordoba, thank you very much for uh, enlightening us uh, and for the presentation. Uh, really glad to have had an opportunity to hear, um, you know, from uh, from our host um, here, and also just getting into uh, some of the activities that are that have uh, commemorated Colombian migrants, but also bringing in how uh, the role of consular um, uh, in, in sort of dealing with COVID and dealing with crisis and how that cultural aspects um, uh, remain critical, uh, even for engagement in such times. Uh, also very happy to hear about some of the reflections that you have shared on looking forward into the future, uh, talking about diaspora as social capital, and also looking at culture as an essential part of that. But also um, your very first point that, that touched me there on, on the need for data, uh, and indeed data becomes uh, very important even as we're looking at uh, a capital, uh, cultural capital in understanding um, how best the needs of the diaspora uh, would be responded to, but also indeed in defining the context of the diaspora. Thank you very much uh, for sharing those reflections uh, with us. Um, and we will now um, move to another segment uh, of the session uh, today. Like I had mentioned previously, as part of this uh, invitation to, um, uh, to, to, to the technical working group, we had uh, shared as an attachment um, a document uh, or rather background paper that uh, looks at diaspora cap uh, cultural capital. And I'm really delighted for this particular segment to invite um, uh, Larissa Lara, Dr. Larissa Lara, who uh, 
has become not only but a colleague, but a, a friend. And she is the Transnational Communities and Diaspora, Communi uh, Diaspora Digital Communities Officer at uh, the International Organization for Migration based in Geneva. She is really uh, uh, an important face to this summit itself. Uh, and uh, Larissa, thank you for all the important work that you do. And even as Larissa is coming on uh, to make the presentation, I would just also like to uh, share a bit more from her bio. Um, Larissa has a PhD from the Center of Ethnic and Migration Studies at the University of Liège uh, and the Research Unit of the Migration and Society from the University of Paris. She holds a Master's in Migration Studies from the University of Oxford and uh, a Master's of Arts in Conflict, Security and Development from King's College London. And apart from that, uh, a search on her name gives you uh, a wealth of the multiple academic articles that she has written, she has uh, published uh, specializing in transnationalism and diaspora engagement and really delighted that she's here to share with us um, the background paper that talks that is centered around uh, paving the way uh, to achieving a global uh, objective 19 of uh, the GCM, particularly focusing on the diaspora cultural capital. Larissa, take us away. Thank you so much, buddy. I just want to make sure. Shukran, Gaziram, buddy. Argu and Takunu Tarona al Shesha Azim. أولا أود أن أهنى حكومة كولومبيا على هذا العرض الممتاز إنما أنجزته عظيم للغاية حيث أن هناك عدد كبير من الأنشاط ليس فقط في المجال الثقافي فقد تحدثتم عن المسرح وعن الشعر وعن الغناء ولا أتذكر الكلمة الإنجليزية لما قلت على أي حال أسعدني أن أكون معكم اليوم وسوف أتحدث عن رأس المال الثقافي لأن هذا الأمر الأساسي بالنسبة للمهاجرين أو للشتات وأرى أن هذا هو المجال الهام وينبغي أن يثبت المهاجر بوطنه الأصل ف. أظن أنه ينبغي أن نستثمر الوقت والجهد وأكثر من ذلك والموارد البشرية وموارد أخرى في هذا في هذا الجانب. إذا ينبغي أن نحدد الأمور ويعطوني ثواني فرأس المال الثقافي هو بمثابة الحصول على وجهة نظر وأفكار وقيم وبالنسبة التي تسري المجتمع وتسري المجتمعات والتنوع والمرونة فيها فأنا لو كنت في بلد المهجر أو البلد الأصلي فإن الإسراء للمجتمع يتم وأظن أننا يمكن دائماً أن نستفيد من مختلف الثقافات من بعضنا بعضا إذن هذه التنوع سوف يكون أمراً أساسياً في, في الخطوات المقبلة وأتطلع إلى الأمثلة والمناقشات التي سوف نخرط فيها فالثقافة هي الصمغة هي مسابة الصمغة أو العنصر الذي يجمع الجميع وإدماج المهاجرين يتوقف بصفة أساسية على الثقافة وأنني يسعدني أن أخوض في هذه فما هي قوة الثقافة تجعل المرأة يشعر بالاتصال والارتباط من خلال التاريخ ومن خلال الترفيه والخبرات المشتركة ونحاول أن ننشأ أشياء مشتركة وما هي القوى الحقيقية إن هذا سوف يؤدي إلى الشعور بالانتماء والناس يعملون معا لأن هناك حاجة لإعطاء شيء للمجتمع لأنهم يرى يؤمنون بهذه القيم التي تكمن فيها أو التي تتمثل في هذه الأنشطة ومرة أخرى أظن أن هذا له أهميته واليوم سوف نناقش مجالات رئيسية ثلاثة كالهوية والانتماء وسواء واللغة فالبلد المضيف يتحدث بلغته الأصلية ويتأكد حاول يتأكد أن الجيل الثاني والثالث من لبنان وفي أوروبا يتحدثون الأسبانية إن أننا نرتبط من خلال اللغة ثم بعد ذلك نعرف على الإرث الثقافي أظن أن حكومة أيرلندا هي مثل أساسي بالنسبة لهذه المجالات الخاصة بالإشراك والإدماج الثقافي أولا سوف نناقش 
ما هي رأس المال الثقافي للمهاجرين ونتناول البلدان سواء كانت بلدان الأصل أو بلدان الإقامة وكلاهما له أهميته وسوف نتشاطر معكم كل هذه الأفكار وسوف نتناول حتى هذه المجالات الأربع للإشتراك أولا سوف تكون ال of cultural celebrations. Again, it was a pleasure to listen to um, Colombia having a specific day for migrants. So that's that's really incredible. The, in terms of ancestry and belonging, why is it so important for countries and beyond governments to invest in this area of diaspora engagement? Very simple, is it's key for soft and smart power. People get connected through this sense of belonging, through this Uh, common history. And also, it is important to create strategic linkages with um, members of diasporas based in that um, common thread that is a uh, common thread, sorry, that is um, that is uh, culture. So in the, it's also very important to put individuals at the forefront of all of this. Why? Because we have to consider age, gender, the personal interest of diasporas. People get attracted by the things they know. And they also create um, commonalities by their interest. So it makes total sense to tailor every single program that we're creating. Um, and finally, a cultural uh, commonality can, of course, create more collaboration among different um, stakeholders. So, and as I was sharing just before we opened the session with um, with uh, uh, Mr. Cordova, Carlos Cordova. Um, When you attend any concert, any theater, it goes beyond those two hours. You start creating a, a common, uh, um, I would say, uh, you start cre creating connections. The power of networking, it, it's also there. You share a cup of tea, then you discuss what's about, what, what was the, the film about or what was the, the piece of theater about. And that creates reflection, creates connections, creates friendship, and then creates action. So that's why culture is very important in terms of diaspora engagement. Related to the preservation of language, I just want to mention that, um, as was shared by, by our host countries, language and education, of course, creates linkages. So we have seen um, multiple times by um, different case studies that it is very important to connect um, and to keep that glue of culture through um, different generations. And there are many ways of doing it, not only physically, but also in the digital space. And of course, COVID has show, showed that it's uh, key and it's very feasible. So creating those linkages is also possible through the digital space. And of course, we have to be considerate of the potential challenges that we are facing in the, this digital era. We have discussed today many of them um, in our panel, in our session six, but it's important to consider data protection, security, and of course, um, all of, of the digital um, literacy barriers that we may encounter. Uh, the next uh, area of engagement that I would like to, to emphasize is the promotion of cultural heritage. It is very important to consider all the different types and sectors of culture, from arts to cuisine to music to sports. People connect differently. People have different interests. So we have to zoom into their experiences to learn more about what they want, what they need, and how they can even engage more and connect with their home societies. So I, I think this, this is crucial. So... Um, We need to keep working for the further recognition of talent uh, from diasporas, from the younger generation, and all the contributions that they can make across the different fields and sectors in society. And we, of course, need to think much more about the longer term effects. So once we invest in uh, developing cultural, uh, cultural specific programs, of course, we might not see immediately the... the um, the capital that we're investing in, but trust me, once you invest in it, you start creating those linkages and you make more a much more sustainable way of engaging with your diasporas. So, of course, one, two, uh, just to mention two potential um, leverages on that could be a nostalgic trade, 
cultural heritage tourism. So sometimes I think we might focus quite a bit in the economic side of, of the diaspora engagement, and it is crucial to keep mentioning the cultural one and the power of it. Then in terms of calendars of cultural celebration, which is another key area of diaspora engagement, um, one of the key of the key points that, that I want to make is that it is very important to start creating and developing, nurturing uh, partnerships with the private sector. We have seen today in multiple discussions that this is key to attract and to, uh, to attract more, more diasporans that are working in that sector, but also to, to keep mobilizing resources, people, interest, and all of this, to keep outreaching to more and more people, to, to keep recognizing what diasporas are doing. Um, in terms of uh, specifics, we can talk about um, the regional belonging. So another point that I would like to make is that, of course, um, belonging is not just defined by a city. It could be also defined by a country and also by a region. I feel Latin American as much as I feel Mexican, and it's not a problem. So it also depends on how people perceive themselves and it's important to recognize all of those different layers of belonging to create very specific programs and to keep developing um, and engaging with diasporas. Um, finally, another point would be, um, of course, to create uh, very fun initiatives. I think that's crucial because uh, people like to have fun and, um, and to create innovative solutions and ways of engagement, specifically the young generation, I have to say. Um, so we have at IOM, we have different uh, examples of those. And of course, our governments um, in, 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 um, in these sessions have also um, quite a lot of experience doing that. So it would be great to hear a little bit more on those experiences. Um, just a um, few points before we go to the country of residence. Of course, I, um, Paddy was al already introducing these three pillars, the institutional one, the information, and finally the implementation. So the way we decided to talk about those is to try to have a holistic view on diaspora engagement. And in terms of cultural capital engagement, we believe that it is very important to start investing more in this area, but also because um, it creates a collabor and also to feed a collaborative, uh, collaborative institutional framework um, to develop clear communication out and outreach strategies. Again, I have been mentioning a lot of tailoring, tailoring, tailoring. I think that's key for success. Um, to really know your diaspora, to really know who you're targeting in, in your diaspora, because we have to remember that diasporas are very diverse. So depending on who we are targeting and how we want to engage with them, we would need to listen to their needs directly. Um, we have been already discussing about the, the emergence of much more um, digitalized ways of connecting with diasporas, offering them services. Um, so also important to consider. And finally, to ensure active storytelling. Everyone loves histories, his, uh, stories. Stories move people. So it's always very important to capture those personal stories to share. That's why um, we tried to implement that in this Global Diaspora Summit, inviting keynote speakers to, to give an actual TED Talk, because we are conscious that stories move people. So that's another uh, reflection that we wanted to share with you today. Now let's go to the countries of residence. I will be um, uh, sharing with you some key areas of engagement in regards to the countries of residence. So as I was, I was sharing before, multicultural composition of societies, it's happening, it is here, and it's very rich, and we have to take advantage of it because I couldn't imagine a monocultural place where it would be, uh, personally, I would feel that it's, it's quite boring. I really love to engage with people from different cultures and to learn much more about them. And I think um, you, you might have heard about the, the term coined by Vertovec, super diversity is key for diaspora engagement, specifically in countries of residence. So there are many different instruments to connect with diasporas um, in countries of residence, but it's also important to be conscious that uh, this environment has to be created across different levels of government so that diasporas can communicate safely, can celebrate their countries in a very safe environment and create those connections with the host society, which are very 
incredible when you look at the examples of success. In terms of uh, specific areas of engagement, I would just go um, into three. Uh, of course, this is not, uh, uh, I, I, I should have mentioned that, it's not um, a complete analysis. We're just pointing out indicators and, of course, open for discussion on how to, to make this much more uh, comprehensive. In terms of um, how countries of residence can develop diaspora engagement policies, in particular at the cultural level, I would just present these three, integration and community development, affinity diaspora, and cross-cultural leadership. In terms of integration and community development, as I was saying before, diversity and even super diversity is here. So we have to embrace it and we have to be very joyful of it. So integrating diasporas at different levels of, um, of uh, engagement at the cultural level is also very uh, enriching for societies. Diasporas have a lot of talent. Diasporas know how to navigate multiple contexts. When you travel, I, um, you learn a lot, right? So diasporas have this dynamic of understanding different contexts, even different bureaucracies, as easy as that. Um, I think that's, that's fantastic to think about. Um, diasporas are resilient, and it is also very important to learn from them at the local level in countries of residence. They really can create innovation solu innovative solutions for um, specific uh, problems. Um, for instance, uh, I don't know, you, you, you have a memory from your home country and then you arrive to the host country and then you, you remember that and you just implement it. That ability of implementing, I think diasporas have this toolkit in their heads that can be uh, very uh, applicable in different contexts. So that's why we think um, that strengthening these uh, connections between countries of origin, countries of destination, and even diasporas themselves at the center, it is very important. And to give diasporas the opportunity to learn more about um, in terms of capacity building so that they can consolidate as civil society organizations institutionalization is key for this because it ensures sustainability. So that's another message um, that I wanted to share with you today. In terms of affinity, um, affinity diaspora in particular, of course, um, I have been sharing with you even my personal stories, but um, people are, whenever they travel, whenever they move from country to country, they start accumulating experiences and that defines their identity. So sometimes people have had the chance to travel in different countries and to keep those identities um, in their memories. So we're, we would be looking at transnational identities, different conceptualizations of identity and sense of belonging. And that's very important if you think about it. When people have two passports, they have the right to vote in two countries. So in, in, whenever that's possible, of course. So that is also important to, to think about. We are in a very multicultural and very diverse um, world. And these hyphenated identities are also important to consider even for governments. And I would say very importantly for governments, if you think about that diaspora diplomacy element. Finally, I would like to just go into the cross-cultural leadership. So countries of residence can access leadership and networks of di from diasporas, of course, because as I was saying before, diasporas have the talent, have the connections, they act as bridges. They communicate between different, so different societies and different countries. So it, it is uh, very valuable to, to, to consider them in, in policymaking and in programming. Um, they are, of course, um, communities that are rich, competitive, diverse. As I was saying, they have their own background, they have their own connections and their own experiences that can enrich even more the societies where we're living in. I think um, just to, final, to give the final words on this, on this uh, section, that strategic investment in the area of culture, culture is key. Connecting leaders is very important. There are many different programs where leaders interact and share experiences. They learn uh, from each other and they maximize their investment in the different areas of development. Um, I would like to just go a little bit more into depth into how to capitalize and how to maximize the use and the implementation of culture in diaspora engagement. It would be very important to keep 
uh, mainstreaming cultural engagement of diasporas, as I was say, saying before, in policies and programs, that's key. Um, remember that sustainability element, it is, it is crucial. I personally believe that um, cultural events of diaspora organizations are incredible. You learn so much from those experiences and you are just exposed to different ways of uh, doing things. Uh, I'm very sure that you enjoy um, your Peruvian ceviche, you enjoy um, your raclette. All of this diversity is amazing. We don't have to, to stick to just one element. Let's share, let's share experiences. I think that's, that also connects people. So let's keep um, producing really exciting cultural events and programs to support that, um, that interconnectivity. It is also key to um, keep the active participation of diaspora cultural gatekeepers in the different fields of culture, meaning arts, gastronomy, sports, and all the different creative industries, design, fashion even. Um, there are so many. And finally, I would say that it is also very important to celebrate diaspora cultural overachievers. There are key leaders out there, and it's always very nice to recognize them, to create specific programs to recognize their activities, because they, at the end of the day, they are ambassadors of, the, of, of countries. Just this is my last slide. Um, I would like to, to just make some final reflections on the three pillars that we're also advocating to analyze in this conference and in this Global Diaspora Summit, which are three, policy, programs, and, and partnership. And in terms of cultural diaspora engagement, it is, again, very important to keep recognizing diaspora culture as a key pillar of diaspora engagement. In terms of programming, let's keep investing in that portfolio of cultural products and promotion activities. It is very important to keep investing in this for the sustainability of that love for the home country. And finally, in terms of partnerships, again, I will keep repeating it, it is very important to create multi-stakeholder approaches. We learn so much from each other. And in today's discussion that I was, um, I had the, the, the honor to, to, um, to moderate, it, it really resonates to, to keep sharing those experiences between private sector, between governments, between uh, academia, between the civil society, diasporas, and um, the international organizations. We learn a lot from each other, and we need to keep building those um, connections. That would be it from my side. I hope um, to, to learn more from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh Larissa, it's always a joy to be on the same stage with you, but it's more of a joy to listen to you. Uh, like I've always uh, said, it's just uh, very insightful. Um, and often when somebody would say, you know, the work around diaspora engagement may sound very plain, you make it a lot of fun. And I think in this particular space where we're talking about cultural capital, you have managed to break down for us uh, what these elements need. It's basically our daily life. That's how I thought about it, all the way to how we communicate. You know, the first thing we think about, I always say the language in which I dream, right? And all the way to the engagement that you have around that day, uh, the food you eat, um, uh, the engagement with the people, and, and also just to show how diaspora has agency. Um, I really liked how you also brought in, not just, you know, breaking it down in terms of us looking at identity, belonging, the language and the cultural heritage, but also really looking at the role of the different countries, um, you know, both from the countries of origin, but also the countries of, of, of destination, um, and bringing in the fact that uh, diaspora um, uh, and, and that diaspora cultural capital enriches the spaces that it is. And I also dare to add for communities that are in a long time in transit to say that shapes and changes. You know, how many times have we heard, for instance, an important uh, stop, even for even though um, it's not looked at uh, very closely, for instance, in Niger, a lot of migrants passing through uh, several cities that have transformed and shaped from what people do and how they engage simply because migrants are passing by in this space uh, and how diaspora has captured uh, that, that, that particular space. But I think in many other places also in transit, we can think about, you know, how how, dias how, how that capital uh, remains very important and enriches and touches, if you like, also a lot on the economic parts. Uh, and it was also very interesting to hear the kind of having this 
whole of society approach, right? You know, how do we bring in the private sector here? Uh, that becomes uh, very important. I'm always reminded of a show that I watched around food that was about chefs. Now I can't remember the title, but it took you to uh, very interesting chefs around the world. And when you looked really in the background, you found that there was something very diasporic about them, as I would say, uh, for lack of another way to, to put that. So thanks a lot. But I, I think it's also been very important for us to talk about attentive listening. And I think attentive Attentive listening is very important uh, in engagement so that the targeting is right and also that the tailoring is done uh, to suit the audience. And here again, echoing the importance of data. Thank you so much uh, in, in, in bringing these reflections. And <clears throat> for this particular segment, we just want to, you know, um, take some time to reflect from a regional perspective. So they, we have some kind of regional reflections that will come and I will ask um, uh, some colleagues to, to come and share uh, with us. So we have Victoria Amato from the International Organization for Migration who will be sharing from the regional consultation uh, from a Latin American perspective and from Europe, Asia uh, and Pacific, we have uh, Mariam Keburia from Georgia, who is the attache at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Department for Diaspora Relations. And then again, we'll have uh, Larissa share for us uh, reflections from the Africa perspective. So uh, I, I ask that we just try to uh, stick to some time so that we can get into the discussion. I think there's a lot that's happening in the chat. Martin Russell, it's really nice to see you in there. And I think I just wanted to echo one of the topics that you brought uh, that you brought in, talking about how fascinating indeed to get these very different insi insights uh, from those that have shared the stage with us. And Victoria, over to you to share with us the regional consultation from the Latin American perspective. Buenas tardes a todos y todas. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Brilliant. Thank you very much for this space. I am Victoria Amato. I work as a regional assistant for human development and labor mobility for Latin America of IOM. And I will now present on the cultural capital access um, created by diaspora and some um, other findings of the um, Latin America Migration Summit. In that space, we formulated this question, what are the challenges, opportunities, and key partners to build long-term and sustainable mechanism to empower diaspora cultural capital. When it comes to those questions, on the one hand, we identify the, these points that I will uh, explain. First, we identified and mapped the, in, the diaspora members in every country. And taking into account the cultural diversity that there really is, we saw the need to deepen the definition of affinities and desperate communities within the framing, the framework of existing cultural diversity in order to get to know the particularities. And we also underlined the systematization of linkage approaches with the diaspora, for example, seeking agreement with other ministries of foreign affairs in the region. When it comes to opportunities, in this consultation, we mentioned a better usage of diaspora members for the contribution of culture. And when it comes to language, specifically, we stress out the need of initiative to link the diaspora with uh, the community of origin. For instance, through distance education services or language certification programs. Uh, lastly, when it comes to opportunities, we also mentioned the possibility of uh, developing digital platform for cultural empowerment of communities who are even more remote and that will promote a greater linkage with the co local culture. In this uh, regional consultation exercise, we also identify key partners. 
uh, when defining key partners in order to apply those actions that were suggested, we acknowledge specifically the diplomatic representation in countries of residence, also the link with art and theater producers, universities, and departments of art, music, museums, galleries, also the link with the deep a deep link with local ministries, Department of Cultures, with managers and cultural associations. Also, we brought in links with ministries of education and universities and foreign affairs. We wanted to identify the three main priorities in order to empower the cultural capital of diaspora. In that sense, we identified these three priorities that you can see on screen. And what do they say? We identify culture as a tool for diplomatic relation between countries. We promote a positive narrative of migration as an element that then enhances the culture and economy of the countries of destination. And lastly, we should allocate more funds for the dissemination of cultures and to promote impact measurements uh, when it comes to cultural dissemination. Um, that will be all on my side. These are the reflections of this consultation. I would like to end. Uh, thank you for your attention. I will give the floor to the next colleague. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mariam? Over thank you. Uh, maybe I will try. Thank you very much for this really, really fascinating uh, messages and information that you have uh, kindly uh, shared with us. I've been following this summit, of course, from the, from the beginning, and I'm so excited that um, I am the part of this agenda and that I personally can contribute to the um, to the to uh, our global and, and common challenges and common um, efforts that we are putting uh, uh, to have a better better world. So I'm, I'm also very grateful for this opportunity of presenting you some of the key findings or the key outcomes of our regional discussions um, of, of, from our group. Um, many of the things have already been highlighted, of course, but let me uh, very briefly outline some uh, things that I would love to communicate uh, from our part. One of the, so we have um, uh, discussed around the three topics, um, the three uh, uh, basic questions. And these questions were referred to the policies, to the practices of uh, cultural diaspora engagement and, and uh, uh, advancing the cultural capital uh, through different means. Policies, practices, and of course the actors, the key stakeholders who would be engaged in this. So while discussing these three, some um, of our colleagues have highlighted from our region uh, the importance of mapping and profiling the cultural uh, capital in different uh, countries. That was one of the challenging things that was uh, identified so that um, the government um, entities or the agencies, state agencies, uh, find it uh, rather uh, challenging things to have uh, more or less um, more or less um, uh, um, uh, relevant uh, understanding about the, uh, the profiles of their diasporas and having the comprehensive mapping exercises of their diasporas uh, in terms of cultural capital as well. The next thing was about receiving states as well and the, uh, the opportunities that uh, uh, these receiving states would offer uh, in terms of funding schemes, for instance, to explore and to flourish the diaspora the diversities, the cultural diversities in the receiving states. Of course, the language uh, uh, as a key tool and the driving form, uh, force in, in, in a positive uh, form, uh, a driving glue for the cultural uh, capital for, for the diaspora was also highlighted. And many of uh, the speakers have um, uh, brought to the attention of the audience that um, the language, keeping the language and uh, was um, one of the key policies for many sending for, for many countries of origin uh, 
um, and uh, especially especially in case of the small countries such as Georgia, for example. And another, as, as was highlighted very uh, nicely and beautifully um, by our previous presenters, uh, the cultural identity, connectedness. Of course, these two things have been highlighted in our uh, regional um, group as well. And one of the challenging things was that many of, uh, as, as expressed by our participants, was that many people would like to be recognized, of course, and also to be enabled to contribute, uh, to contribute for free, of course. And so that was one of the things that was brought uh, forward, to enable as many um, diaspora representatives as possible to contribute whenever they can. And it's not only about the country to diaspora relations, but also the cities and the regional um, uh, connections, uh, strengthening regional connections and the city uh, city to diaspora connections as well. And of course, one of the key points was highlighted um, the activation or the empowerment of young diaspora representatives, the youth as a key you know, drivers, uh, uh, of uh, especially in this digital. And you have, uh, some uh, some of the speakers have also highlighted it as a, as a drivers, especially in the digital, uh, digital uh, era. Uh, mobilization, mapping, mobilization, and empowerment of um, you know, the youth uh, representatives, diaspora representatives. Um, whole of society approach was brought forward, of course, and we have highlighted that none of the diaspora organizations, however strong or, or the association it is, can function or um, have impact without close collaboration with them. Mm. Uh, with uh, the uh, different organizations, none of the governments can uh, uh, or institutions can succeed without a, a whole society approach and cross-sector inter-institutional collaboration. So that was highlighted, and of course, one of the you know, key things that was from, uh, that was highlighted was a piece. The piece that uh, our world currently, uh, especially now, needs uh, in order to put all the other policies and programs and actors uh, on on the same page and to um, uh, uh, yeah to make efforts to uh, develop uh, further and to develop with the help of our cultural capital, um, uh, the cultural diaspora, uh, indeed. Uh, yeah, I, I find it rather hard to, <laughs> to to add something because most of the things were really highlighted beautifully and uh, delivered, um, uh, communicated so well. Uh, I'm really excited to be the part of um, uh, part of the summit, and I look forward to the other days as well. Thank you so much for having um, uh, for, for for having this opportunity for for us as well. Thank you. Mariam, thank you very much for sharing those um, reflections from Europe, Asia, Pacific. Um, and now I will hand it over to Larissa uh, to share with us reflections from the African perspective. Larissa. Thank you so much, Paddy. Just very briefly, because as it has been mentioned, I think the key point here is we're all on the same page. We're recognizing the same areas of where we can invest and create programs that are um, tailored that are uh, having an impact. So in the African consultation, it was also very, very in inspiring, to be honest, to listen to the same type of reflections. Keep investing in, in and focusing on second and third generation programs, cultural programs. And I, I would even say to go beyond those, because once we, we start connected with the homeland, that could keep going. Um, they also reflected on keep... Um, developing cultural fe festivals, the importance of diaspora tourism. They even mentioned the power of soccer teams, which is absolutely true. Um, I know I know from my from my home country that it's very important and in other settings also religion is, is very important. So again, let's keep reflecting on those mechanisms to tailor the programs to the diaspora that we want to connect with. Um, in terms of key recommendations, um, very just echoing what we have already said, they they talked a lot about developing cultural packages to attract different ver um, groups of diasporas and also to keep feeding connections with actors, musicians, poets, even academic in industries and keep promoting cultural exchanges. So I think I'm very happy to, to listen that, to, that there is a coherence and we have a clear path of where we want to go. Um, so just thanking all the panelists for sharing what has, has been said in your sessions. Thank you very much. Larissa, thank you very much. And also to all the panelists, um, Victoria and Mariam, for, for sharing those reflections uh, from a regional perspective. I think it has been very enriching. Um, and uh, with that, I think I would like us to 
take, you know, all a lot of us have been speaking a lot and now we just want to open the floor for those rich discussions coming in from the floor. We know that there was some interaction before even from um, from the floor and that's very good to see. There was a question uh, that has been raised um, that is directed uh, uh, to Colombia uh, from from Tracy O'Connor. Did you, Tracy? Did you want to give a bit of context to this, or did you feel uh, a response would be good? It's a technical discussion, so we we can put down the rules. I know my colleagues in the technical room are looking and saying, "Ah, but we make it very light uh, in order for us to engage in this discussion." Tracy, thank you, Paddy. Uh, it was really just a reflection as the information was being shared by Carlos. Uh, just in relation to the percentage and what the what the numbers of migrants in Colombia or outside Colombia are in terms of the diaspora in relation to the population of the country, just to get a sort of a context, because it seems to be a very, a very vast number from what you're saying. That was all. But it's not necessarily important for the discussion now. It was in the moment at the time. So <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, I just thought that was good for us to um, to have some clarity. Carlos, did you want to give a quick reflection before we go into um, you know the interventions from from this virtual floor? Thank you so much, Patty, and of course, Tracy. It is an important information related with our population here in Colombia and of course our diaspora. Um, the pandemic. Uh, generates movement of population in and out of Colombia. So uh, maybe the last uh, study I, I know about the, the population, uh, um, the diaspora, the Colombian diaspora is around 5 million of people, around 5 million people. So this is maybe 10% of the Colombian population. And it is a huge percentage. And maybe what are the most common destinations for our diaspora? Maybe the region here in, in South America, uh, countries uh, around us, our neighbors in, in, this, in, in, in this region, like Venezuela, Ecuador. But of course, one of the most important uh, destinations for our diaspora is United States, uh, Europe, and particularly Spain. I don't know. Uh, I try to 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 explain to show how our diaspora is, is moving. That that that's I want to say about your question. Any other question? Thank you. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, to our hosts um, for that. And now we, you know, we have some some questions that uh, we thought would be important for us to steer the discussion. And I'll just ask colleagues if that uh, slide could be uh, pinned up as we are as as we are coming on. Um, uh, the idea is really for us to listen to those who are in the room. Please feel free to uh, share in your reflections um, on these questions. Um, and just looking to see. Is it only from my side? Fiona, if you could pin those up. Super, thanks, Larissa. Mm. Just as the questions are coming up, um, you know, the, 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 uh, just raise your hand if you would like to um, address a question. If the hand raising feature is not working on your device, if you come into the chat, we'll be able to identify that you were there. Uh, Juan uh, has their hand. Juan, did you want to take the floor? Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, it's a big pleasure. Uh, I would like to ask, um, uh, what mm, do you consider, well, the, the conferences consider um, more appropriate as a mechanism to prevent distortion, tergiversation, or um, of the cultural heritage in, among the diaspora communities and how to harmonize it with the new created heritage, the, the current heritage that is being created in the present. Thanks very much to everyone. It's a big pleasure to be here. 
Thank you very much. Um, and because it's an open space, you know, not just our panelists could address that one. It could also be interesting to hear from those that are joining us from various spaces. Uh, we could probably combine uh, that question in response to some of the guiding questions that we have in front of us. Uh, and we're really mm -hmm. trying to look at that policy, pragmatic and partnership level. And at each level, we're trying to kind of listen into the best practices that are out there, um, you know, in, in, in relation to the specific themes that we that we have uh, that have been unpacked uh, for us. Uh, and so the idea is to sort of hear uh, from around the room. So please feel free. Um, otherwise, I use my arm uh, as moderator to pick some familiar faces that I see coming up. Uh, you know, so in terms of the policy, you know, what do you identify as a, as a collective policy action, um, a collective action at policy level uh, in order to achieve that global collaborative action on diaspora uh, cultural capital? Uh, and also at the programmatic level, what is that collective action that is there to achieve global collaborative action also in the same space and also in the partnership uh, level as well to just get a sense of what we're seeing as those collective actions. So what are we really seeing on the ground, you know, in terms of partnerships, in terms of programs, in terms of policies, how are, you know, how are governments and how are diaspora engagement mechanisms uh, shaped in different ways? Um, we're representing different spaces here, so it would be great um, to hear from others. Um, Martin, may I put you on the spot? Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. No, look, I, I think it's a great question. I think, while well, in the sense of, you know, one of the things when we, when we think about a policy level, the first question we have to consider is who, who do we consider our diaspora to be? And, and, and what do I mean by that? You know, if I give you an example from the, from, the Irish exa from the Irish context, if you go talk to an Irish person that's living in the US or if you go talk to a third or fourth generation Irish American, they're fundamentally different conversations. And in many ways, how they view their sense of connection back home and, and their sense of cultural connection and how they want to engage culturally, it's it's a completely different <laughs> different conversation. So I think what's interesting is, is, you know, there has to be a strategic decision made early in the policy process to think about, you know, what is the clear definition that we're working from here? Because I think that impacts in terms of what Larissa was saying in terms of how you tailor and how you engage with the community. And I think what's interesting as well is that, you know, we have to keep an eye out and there can be tensions within the diaspora <laughs> across that area as well. I, I, don't, I don't mind telling uh, a funny story of hosting a focus group with the Irish diaspora in Canada, where you had recent immigrants who had one perspective on Ireland and you had kind of people that were in Canada for many decades had a different perspective and they didn't necessarily align. <laughs> you know, And there was a bit of, bit, of, bit, of, bit of tension in the room when we had that. So I think what's, what's important is, is to try and make sure that what we design at a policy level or, or a programmatic level is, is culturally respectful of the different layers and generations that are working across our diaspora. And I think, you know, that will mean different types of cultural engagements across those. And I think that echoes Larissa's point about, you know, somebody maybe who's 18 to 35 will want to engage in a different way than maybe somebody that is, you know, 55 to 65. And it's, just, it's about having that nuance across what we do. But one of the things I would say is that I don't think anybody's one sense of affinity or connection should be more important than another's. So it's important from a government perspective, I would argue that we, we build that nuance into what we're trying to achieve. And I think, you know, my final reflection on that from, from a governmental point of view is that, you know, it comes back to that idea of maybe the government facilitating cultural engagements, because what should organically happen across the diaspora community is that there will be either networks or organizations that are engaging with these different layers of the community. And I think that's something we have to think about in diaspora engagement is, you know, whilst it's important we're building policies and structures and institutions, that needs to happen in the diaspora as well. And we need to figure out how do we build the community infrastructure across the diaspora because they become the distribution mechanism. So, so there's a couple of quick reflections from my end. I hope that was good enough on the spot, Patty. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll hand back in that note. <laughs> that was a nice icebreaker, uh, I have to say. And and just also, again, you know, just, you know, wanting, you know, to just look into the room, right? Um we have diaspora uh, organizations, but we also have representation from different spaces. So for us, it's also, 
a bit to get the sense from the governments that are attending here, you know, what have you found to be, for instance, the greatest challenge in, 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 in engaging with diaspora uh, cultural capital? I think, you know, Martin, what you also just raised in terms of working across generations, uh, because often what you find, I guess, at that realm of a, an organized diaspora is that you've got, you know, the older generation uh, and, you know, how much of the youth are represented on, on sort of diaspora engage, uh, diaspora organization boards or how much of that youth engagement is coming up, but also how proactive are the youth uh, wanting to engage? Uh, so I think I think those are those would be some of the interesting um, uh, insights we could you know take from from those in the room. Uh, looking again into the room, I think it would be great for us to hear from. Uh, I saw that there was a, a question, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm putting people who are asking questions a bit on the spot. But Hango uh, Hango uh, uh, Slack, you asked the question that was asking about diaspora empowerment in the home country, and how government uh, how can government be more involved in sharing cultural heritage? And I just thought, you know, from your perspective, what are you seeing actually on the ground? Hango, uh, did you want to uh, share in uh, uh, on this? Uh, I know you asked the question, and I'm coming back to to just hear a bit from what you were seeing from your perspective. Heingo? Oh. Uh, hello? Yes, 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 Juan. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much. Okay. Um, yeah, we're facing the process, the continued process of uh, digitization and modification of the original cultural heritage. So, uh, and we face a dilemma how to create new heritage, but at the same time, how to transmit in a loyal way, in a proper way, in a, in a very, uh, with accuracy, the original or the valuable um, real heritage that we're supposed to transmit as members of, of the diaspora. Uh, because we face a lot of changes uh, from our original heritage. So what's the challenges? Where are the alternatives, the mechanisms, the options, the, the suggestions? Because we need to be very careful with the, the the community in which we are living in. But at the same time, we owe some loyalty to our original heritage. So that's kind of a dilemma. And I would like to, to hear the, the researchers that have big experience on that. Thanks very much again. Some interesting perspective there. Uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, I wondered, if I can see in the room, we have people from Peru, we have people from Nigeria. Mandy, I'm about to put you on the spot there to give us a bit of the Caribbean flavor um, in terms of the diaspora, you know, diaspora engagement in the UK. You know, how do you how do you really see of what's working? Uh, I know you're from a diaspora organization, but from your kind of engagement, what is that What is that push around cultural capital? You know, what's really happening in that space from your perspective? Hi, Paddy. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion so far. Can you hear me clearly? Fantastic. Um, in terms of my involvement in, in the whole cultural diaspora movement, um, from day one, it has always been my thing. I, I enjoy the whole idea of us being able to share what we grew up with, with those around us, um, whether it's masquerade, singing, the dress, the food, all of it. And um, the arts are a particular interest to me. So we have always, through Beyond Ianola, tried to pinpoint the areas. And Beyond Ianola is our diaspora focus group. We are St. Lucian focused. Um, and that's part of the Caribbean. I'm not assuming that everybody knows who we are. And um, <laughs> we have found that there are several persons who have either moved to the UK a long time ago, or born here, who aren't quite au fait uh, with what our cultural aspects were, our cultural music, the you know the arts, etc. And it has been a pleasure being able to bring it to them. I can't claim to know the, the Creole language as well as I'd like to, and it's a big thing for us to be able to teach the next generation some of those aspects of culture that we know is going to be lost if we don't do something about it. So as a diaspora organization, we try to highlight, pinpoint, share, collaborate as much as we can in order to promote that. Um, I'm going to bring a bit in about the policy level because St. Lucia does have a diaspora uh, policy. But interestingly enough, it's more focused on the economic side, just linking it a bit to what Larissa was saying. Culture does not show, strangely enough, a lot in there. And that has been something that we have been speaking about. How do we show 
others what we're about if we're only going to think about the economic side of things. Um, I guess in terms of, of economics, that is what everybody's looking for, getting the funds going back to us. And, and that could be one reason why culture does not show up as much as one would hope. Um, and I like the way that Larissa mapped the two things together, showing how culture can be developed so that there is an economic side to it. Um, uh, in terms of what many people have spoken about and alluded to, how do you get culture flowing back into the diaspora? I, I think it has to, to come from you wanting to know. It's kind of I'm kind of hard pressed to say the government should be the one doing it. I think it should come from us. We should be the ones wanting to know about where we are from. And that sort of love and enthusiasm would then sort of spread to others. Um, and then we can demand, we can ask, we can cajole governments to say, well, we are interested. What can you send our way? I don't think it's always from a governmental perspective that it should be developed. Um, I think the diaspora should set its own agenda, but you know that about me. I think we should be the ones to decide what we want, when we want it, and how we want it. And it's just about um, collaborating and ensuring that we are able to convey that passion so that there isn't a choice but to help us along the way. So I'm going to stop there for now. Great, uh, great to hear that. You know, uh, diaspora agency all the way through. Uh, Kirsty uh, Kwateng, you're welcome to share. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kirsty. I wanted to touch a bit on the like youth side. Um, I myself am a second generation Ghanaian, and I'm actually um, working on the process of completing my doctoral dissertation which talks about uh, how the children of Ghanaian immigrants maintain their connections to Ghana. I just kind of wanted to um, encourage everyone to, to remember that second gens, um, as the speaker who just spoke said that, it's on us to kind of have the desire to learn more about our culture and heritage. And at least in the Ghanaian context, uh, second gens are definitely taking on the desire to learn more about Ghana on their own and they're creating uh, diaspora organizations that are relevant to their needs that they have as second generation Ghanaians. And they these orgs focused a lot on arts, history and culture and things of that nature. And I just also wanted to talk about, um, um, there's a big festival in Ghana that's been taking place over the last few years called Afrochella. And this um, is a, it's a big, um, music, it's music, it's arts, it's culture, it's fashion, all the things that we're talking about. And this um, festival was actually created by two uh, second gen Ghanaians uh, from New York. And you can see that the, the desire that they had to not only learn more about their culture, but to share Ghanaian and African culture with the world um, has created this massive festival where people from all over the continent, all over the world come. So it's not only sharing culture, but it's also uh, contributing to you know, the, you know, Ghana's economic development, because this is a, a festival that takes place in um, Accra, Ghana, Ghana's capital. And kind of related to, to that, there definitely is amongst, again, I can only talk about second-gen Ghanaians, um, but in our community, there is, at least what I've seen from my uh, research as well, there's a connection between what I call the identity economy, um, so culture and you know, and financial capital. So people who want to connect with Ghana, they might not have um, had a lot of opportunities to go to Ghana. They might not be able to speak their language well, but because they are um, raised in in Ghanaian homes, homes where they're hearing their languages being spoken, they're eating the food. So they're aware of their um, their cultural heritage and identity, even if they can't totally, you know, totally re relate to it. So in that people, they're trying to find ways to connect to Ghana in ways that make sense for them. So one way is through fashion. So people, they'll, they'll make things that have like, you know, map of Ghana or map of Africa using different Ghanaian symbols. And people will wear, you know, the world, they will wear the hoodies, they'll wear the jewelry that has the you know, different symbols and things on it. So there's a lot of different ways um, that second gens. I know, I know there's, you know, time, I don't want to, I sh you know, go over too much, but I just wanted to give some examples in which, um, or to show how uh, the second, you know, the youth, the second gens, um, that we care, <laughs> that we are involved, we're not disconnected, like a lot of people uh, think, think that we are. And in some ways, we're even um, leading the charge in regards to cultural capital. Thank you. 
Here, Steve, thank you very much for those reflections. And as we say, it's always great uh, to, to hear from the youth uh, uh, yourselves and, and, and in, in, in bringing in these reflections very live to us as we make all this listening, even from this particular forum, very intentional. Thank you for sharing. Um, I wonder if I could bring in um, Frank. Uh, Frank Dosa, did you want to chim in with, with some reflections, uh, knowing that um, a lot of what you are doing, so it's really interesting to hear from this diaspora enterprise point of view. How do you see that? Um, uh, I'm giving you a question, I know, uh, Frank, as you are coming on, but how you're also seeing that interplay with cultural capital? Frank, the floor is yours. Hi, I seem to be having trouble getting my videos. And I was in thought uh, government and some diaspora communities, often, more often in the global south, um, how pushing the cultural capital as an engagement mechanism uh, is quite key to build on that, that uh, sustainability and engagement, especially when you're looking at uh, change of government and how you maintain relationships with the diaspora throughout the duration of time, I think is a, is a key way to push and maintain diaspora engagement. And uh, I think it's a great way of selling the, the, the importance of co the cultural aspect, because often we look at other capital, financial, and the culture is not often taken seriously. And I think it's it has that advantage to build bridges in ways that we don't often value. Thank you, Frank, uh, for, for, for bringing in those reflections. Um, uh, Zoya uh, from Romania, uh, are, you, are you able to share with us? Zoya? Uh, hello. Hi, you're welcome. Uh, hi, hi. I, I, I was not prepared, frankly speaking, but I uh, will be happy to share some thoughts. Uh, we had today uh, our Minister of Diaspora participating in uh, several events. I guess they already uh, presented their Armenian perspectives in a number of issues. For uh, cultural capitals, I mean, um, Armenia is a diasporic nation due to various historical circumstances. We have our communities all over the world. Uh, and uh, I was listening to very inspiring uh, speeches, very inspiring perspectives, new ideas. What comes to my mind is the, uh, the issue of uh, interconnectedness and uh, influence on both ways. Uh, normally, we speak about Armenian diaspora abroad, how they tell the world about Armenia. Uh, but it's also important how this diaspora used to tell Armenia about the world, especially when, the, you know, we live, for example, in Soviet era, when the, this uh, interaction and exposure was much less, when there were no internet and uh, no interconnectedness. So uh, from this perspective, Armenian diaspora communities who uh, came back, who repatriated, played a great role in uh, that historical, for example, time in uh, bringing in, uh, you know, different cultures, different cuisines, different languages. For example, we had a huge number of professors in universities who used to live abroad and who were bringing uh, this, this knowledge uh, of, uh, of the continents of the countries that we otherwise have no connection to. I remember, for example, Sudanese Armenians who came back to Soviet Armenia and who were, you know, uh, kind of representing these uh, spots of uh, culture that we uh, would normally back then wouldn't, uh, you know, able to to approach and to have uh, relations with. Uh, when it comes to uh, our communities, you know, they are very much institutionalized. They have been institutionalized before Armenia become independent as such. Uh, and so at the moment, uh, if I look at the structures that we have, uh, those are schools, mostly Sunday schools, where uh, kids are teaching, uh, are learning language, uh, dances and so, but also, uh, you know, uh, educational institutions. Uh, with the, you know, introduction of internet, with the uh, digital technologies, 
our diaspora communities managed to establish several institutions uh, online, online platform for explicitly for language learning, uh, both uh, Eastern Armenian and the Western one, which is, you know, largely spoken uh, in our diaspora communities. The role of faith-based organizations was highlighted here. Uh, if I may share some thoughts on that, uh, it is significant. It is significant in terms of preservation of national identity and also in terms of uh, bridging in different communities and different religions even, in terms of intercultural and interreligious dialogue, if I may put it this, this way. Uh, but again, uh, various churches outside Armenia who would uh, bring these bridges. And, uh, another uh, important point is uh, cultural industries. Uh, that I want, you know, uh, a little bit touched upon. Uh, not only uh, in terms of, you know, concerts uh, and, the, but for example, in our case, uh, in in the centers when we have large Armenian communities in the United States, in France, in Russia, uh, in other places, uh, this is the first destination where Armenian, for example, cultural uh, industries and uh, cultural organizations will go with the concert. But also in terms of, uh, you know, ex uh, export of cultural goods from Armenia to these uh, spots and from there to Armenia. So again, this bridges in a purely civilizational perspective, purely cultural perspective. Uh, well, th th this is, I think, also important. Uh, when it comes to institutions, again, my uh, very pers personal opinion, uh, it's... Uh, it is also important not to overregulate, I think, uh, because diasporas operate in a largely informal setting. Uh, and uh, it is good that there's a they, they feel their keen state, you know, their uh, but sometimes you feel that that those are independent institutions, those are institutions that have their own logic of operating, have their own agenda in some cases have their specificities. And it is uh, important for us, you know, for our policymakers, for our bureaucracies, not to impose too much, you know, ruling and uh, regulation there in these informal settings, uh, especially when it comes to culture, especially when it comes to creative sectors and uh, the, the uh, areas where this free expression is important. What else can I add? Uh, I'm sure my colleagues from the, uh, the Minister of the, from the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora uh, will, will enlighten you more uh, in terms of our, uh, you know, our priorities for the coming years. Uh, one more thing that, one more small example that I just wanted to highlight is uh, after independence, uh, we have, uh, I mean, during the last 10 years, found very successful uh, diaspora imposed, it was this like, diaspora engagement project, which was a center for creative technologies for IT, for, for uh, which free education. Uh, it, it is because it's, it's you know, and, Discipline. At this moment, Armenia is pioneering and are opening, are helping other countries to open this kind of creative centers. For example, there's one in Kazakhstan, if I'm not mistaken, in France, and so on and so forth. So this is a perfect creative idea developed in lowering uh, this local potential, and now it's going back to the world, if I may put it so. So, uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's the culture, it's learning, it's educational opportunities, it's all, all together. So I guess this is one of the uh, less case, uh, success stories, but there are many, there are many, and I wish we had more time and I would, I would be more prepared to share some with you. But thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh uh, so for share from that wealth of information from the Armenian perspective, I think it has been an absolutely uh, enriching um, uh, uh, listen uh, to the many things that you you have shared, but also the interconnections between various elements uh, from language to education, uh, the use of technology, and also working across uh, generations. Thank you very much uh, for sharing with us. Uh, Mariam, would you like to come in? 
Uh, yes, thank you very much. I wanted to just bring to your attention two uh, points. One, one thing was about yeah difficulties to translate culture-related dimension of diaspora engagement into policies. And in from my perspective, and because I've been engaged in diaspora policy design or or coordination for some uh, time, uh, it's because it's a value-led policy, right? It's a val while talking about culture and. Uh, in engaging and enhancing diaspora's um, cultural capital, it's very much focused on values, and then <laughs> translating values into policies and you know regulations is one of the, in my understanding, one of the challenging things. Another thing that I wanted to highlight, and I'm sure you you agree with me, in our case, for instance, is that now, especially in times of COVID or in times of war in Ukraine, the cultural actors. Uh, in diaspora have uh, become much more important than, or it, it has become kind of a floor, a floor um, for them to act because people would look at them as uh, people working in the culture or people dedicating, devoting themselves to culture, how they would react, how they would take a lead. And I think that these unfortunate and very challenging times have also, uh, on the other hand, have become shown us, everybody, how much these people matter and how much what they do, and maybe they don't always show, <laughs> or maybe they cannot always be seen or translated or, or reflected in the policies and practices. Now we know and go back to them and see what they do, how they take a lead, and we want to share uh, as much stories or retweet as much uh, um, messages, posts uh, from what our cultural champions or I don't know, rock stars uh, as uh, for Kingsley Aikens would put it, diaspora rock stars, right? How they react, how they respond. So um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we have lots of uh, uh, professionals who we can uh, address to in, in these difficult times. Thank you. Uh, Mariam, absolutely. And um, just also being engaged with uh, support to um, particularly African students and nationals coming out of Ukraine, you see how uh, at some point, you know, even just dealing with crisis, how culture really does play a role. For instance, mental health, you know, the accessibility to mental health, knowing that mental health is available. But, you know, how do you navigate that part as well? So while mental health is something that's looked at by, you know, probably in a very, um, in a particular, in a, in a medical space, it really comes to how is it looked like in a cultural perspective um, and many different concepts that also have to come in in just, you know, uh, where the diaspora comes and makes uh, important bridges. Um, uh, but I, I also think um, precisely what you have mentioned and what Zoya was talking about, this part of this value-led, you know, it's a value-led engagement. Uh, and then we're talking about regulation. So, you know, maybe coming into what Mandy had said, just let us think, let us do our thing. And then, you know, uh, on cultural capital, how about, you know, we don't handle it maybe the way economic capital is handled, you know, and that's, that's sort of very important, maybe not having a one size fits all in how you engage with diaspora, but really looking at um, uh, 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 the diaspora in front of you and, you know, what values are, uh, are, are being handed over. But I also think uh, the role of religious groups um, uh, remains very important because that's an important part of people's value systems as well. Uh, you see it also in crisis. Um, one uh, example that uh, comes to mind, and I'm trying to come in with some reflections here as we are closing shortly, but maybe I should hold that thought because, Carlos, I would like to hear from you. Thank you so much, Patty. I just want to say that I'm very happy to be here, to be here hearing your thoughts, your ideas, your uh, experience related with the uh, diaspora. I want to share uh, maybe my thoughts about this discussion about the diaspora and online with Larissa, I consider that diasporic uh, citizenship maybe uh, how I'm creative saying that things um, we we can start uh, highlighting that globally the diaspora can consider actors uh, maybe origin countries by one hand by the other hand um, residents or destination countries, but in the middle are the diaspora, the society, the people who decide migrate. 
to me wait. So, and culturally, the diaspora, the background, the cultural background is between the culture from the origin country and by the other hand, the destination country, the resident country. There is a mix, a cultural mix between, in between. And this is the reason why somebody here talk about the heart that could be considered analyzed and build public policy for these people. That is an invitation, an invitation not just for the residents country, but uh, the origin countries. There is a chance to build a global agreement between the ways we must to behave, what we expect as a society uh, in relation with uh, the uh, diaspora. These macro actors, because I consider the country as a grab, the origin country as a grab, and the destination country as a grab, but the other grab, maybe the most important grab uh, in the discussion of this uh, work here is the diaspora by itself. And why, what we can build for this uh, grab of people. So in general, the approach uh, that Larissa showed us related with policy, um, partnership and program, it is important because consider the populations or the people or the actors maybe, to better say, the actors in the situation. The country, origin country, destination country, and the diaspora. But we have policies in the origin country and the destination country, but what will be the best policy for the diaspora? That this is a, this is a complex population. I want to close with this comment and say thank you uh, for the opportunity to share with you uh, my thoughts about uh, the, this important topic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for sharing those reflections. Uh, I just wanted to check uh, before I will ask uh, Larissa to also share her reflections. Maybe we have a minute more uh, for us to hear from the audience. I know um, some hands had uh, been raised. I think maybe I have missed, I may have missed uh, one or two hands. Please feel free to share. Uh, Larissa, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patty. Just very briefly, I want to share one personal experience, not, a, not at all IOM hat, but more researcher hat, uh, my personal research in, uh, in Belgium, actually. So one day I was walking in the gray Belgium um, and I came across a store that sell that sells Mexican art, and of course I was very excited. So I got in, and I realized that the person that was um, in charge of the store was a Belgian who has been uh, who had lived in Mexico, created connection in Mexico, and then brought the Mexican art. And then that person, that particular store, I, I was also my, doing my PhD in um, with the Mexican community in Belgium. So. Um, I knew them. They were very active in terms of creating um, Dia de Muertos, a national holiday that you, that you may know. And they partnered directly with this Belgian to start creating connections between not only the Mexicans already living there, the diaspora, but also the host community that have been traveling before to Mexico. So we keep connecting these threads. And I will tell you the story just very short. At the beginning, the Mexicans creating this Dia de Muertos um, day and festival, they didn't have funds. They managed to get funds first because of that alliance with this Belgian store who then managed to get funding from the Belgian government. And then the Mexican government was very attracted by this because of this um, diplomacy, soft power um, discussions that we have been having in this panel. 
And then also they started getting involved. And now it's an institutionalized festival that happens every year. So just to, to, to really unpack all these beautiful connections that happen. And I think when people have the will, definitely there is a way. So just circling back to, to the funds and, and all of this. Thank you so much for, for all your, your very insightful inputs in the chat also. Absolutely. What a great example indeed, as others uh, have shared. And also just um, adding to some of the, the comments that have been shared, Tracy was just saying, you know, wouldn't uh, wouldn't it be a, a great um, a great opportunity at some point to have diaspora going home facilitated, uh, um, you know, for, for cultural visits, uh, as well as discounted travel and accommodation. And I think you're seeing these kind of examples uh, in certain places as well, where diaspora are being attracted uh, to come back home and gain couch, uh, culture experience, particularly when people are talking about, for instance, developing ecotourism and, and what you see sort of as the role of diaspora in that space. So uh, some really interesting reflections even in the chat. Um, I wondered, uh, Lisa Bryant, are you, Lisa Bryant, are you able to share some reflections? Lisa? All right. Well, I think that um, there is a lot that has been unpacked. And um, as always, it's uh, it's always uh, difficult to kind of uh, give these uh, uh, closing remarks as as such before I will uh, hand over to 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 um, to our host for this technical working group to officially um, uh, close the the technical working group. But I think some of the examples that have been shared today. Um, and some of the stories, and even through our storytelling, even in this particular session, I think they do tell us the value in exchanging a lot of the information, in exchanging, uh, in, in in sharing a lot of who we are uh, uh, from our language, from our cultural, cultural heritage perspective, from the languages that we speak, from the identities that we carry, and also from the belongings and, and in spaces that uh, we feel we feel attached to. So I think it's in youth engagement is something that has been highlighted, um, working across. Um, uh, generations is very important and how uh, to understand that engagement really has to be intentional with a lot of active listening, um, not just from governments, but I think that has also been echoed to, for instance, structured diaspora, diaspora organizations or even in spaces where the youth are engaging uh, in order for us to understand what they have in the so-called identity economy. Uh, you know, what are they trying to, to look for in, in, in seeking these, these identities? I also think what has come out uh, is leveraging on technology. We have heard about how language, for instance, uh, has been the, the learning of, of, of the, you know, keeping on the, the the learning of languages, home home country languages have been sustained through technology. I'm reminded uh, myself the very first time that I saw one of uh, Zambia has 73. I'm from from Zambia and we have 73 uh, dialects and about seven main languages. Uh, and so it's, it can be hard to pick even in a family where you have four of those languages. But we are seeing even in that kind of environment where some of these languages are being taught in, you know, in spaces where there is diaspora and that becomes a very important connection uh, to, uh, for, for the younger generation particularly in identifying with home but I think we've also heard about how you know culture is that fuel and the glue uh, uh, coming from Larissa as well uh, uh, spelt out uh, really well there but also from the host government really chiming in in talking about how um, intentional they are in commemorating and celebrating uh, culture as, as, as part of capital, uh, looking at cultural capital in its own right, giving it its own own space and really understanding that there's value in the diversity that is there, the role of various actors from, you know, religious organizations, private sector, um, various diaspora organizations themselves has really been brought out as well. So that range of diverse actors uh, trying to make sure that, um, you know, uh, capturing that cultural capital or cultivating the cultural capital is something that is targeted and that's something that is uh, very tailor-made. Um, it's been also interesting to hear about the role of the various countries, the, the home country itself, uh, but also uh, places where people are calling home, so the destination countries, and also chiming in a bit on the transit countries. Um, it's been really, really interesting uh, to just touch on different geographical experiences of how uh, diaspora engage, and but particularly how diaspora wants to nurture 
this cultural capital? How do we continue to nurture it? A lot of interesting recommendations that came out from those regional consultations, but also very much echoing how we've got to not have a, 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 a very rigid, a rigid tool, if you want, or rigid mechanisms, but also to have a lot of dynamism as we approach and allow diaspora to speak uh, from itself and, they, and allow those, those voices to come out all the way through from policy, all the way through to action. But we've also heard of how some things probably don't have to be uh, regulated so we don't kill the creativity. It's been an absolute um, pleasure to be your moderator. And I will now hand back to our host and ask um, Ambassador Cortez to close the session for us. Thank you. I think she mentioned in the chat that she had to leave, but she was going to be yes, able to come yeah. back. So she may not be here. Yeah, so maybe she hasn't heard. Um, Carlos, may we have the honor of you closing the session? Or did you want to just check for a minute if Ambassador is able to uh, avail herself? Would like to give her the opportunity to bid us farewell from this wonderful house. Well, I can maybe my, my, my thoughts will uh, summarize it with my intervention. But if, if I suggest uh, use this time with people who don't uh, mention nothing in, in the past. Okay, it's 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 a uh, it's an open house. Uh, so maybe we can have one more minute if there was someone who has had a thought, a burning issue, uh, or even just to share with us. One of the things I thought that would be very interesting because we've talked a lot about food and I'm feeling uh, quite hungry, not only because it's evening in Europe, uh, but I'm also full of the knowledge that we, you know, we have around here. But I think it would also be very nice uh, just to, you know, to recognize where we're sitting and where we are. And in the chat, if we could be able to say our goodbyes in our own languages, uh, because I know if we open the mic, we're probably not able to hear each other. But, you know, as we would be leaving the room at some point um, after Mr. Carlos has given us uh, the final farewell, we could just plot into the chat how you would say goodbye in your own language. Thank you. Mr. Carlos, over to you. Thank you so much. As a closing, um, an invitation, an invitation to 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 think about um, in in the diasporic process, in the migration process, an opportunity as a chance, as a chance to generate development, to generate. Um, social uh, capital in general as a as a glue for the for the future of the society for a, a better world thank you so much for your thoughts thank you so much for your reflections and thank you so much for hearing me and inviting me to participate of this discussion have a nice day thank you so much Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Carlos. And on that, I think uh, till we meet again, uh, walk good uh, and many more goodbyes in the various languages. Thank you very much for today. <laughs>